Thank you for that. Good morning, all, and uh, thank you for your time here. At Contango, we're committed uh, on this roadshow. This is the first of our semi-annual roadshows in Sydney. We started earlier this week in Melbourne, and we're committed every November and every May to go around Australia to connect as much as we can with our 7,500 uh, shareholders, investors, and also any of our other wholesale sort of uh, clients as well. So thank you for your time. If I can ask uh, from the outset uh, on, on this, if you can be very selfish, you're here with your time, so be very selfish and asking us any question you want. So we'll be talking about a lot of stocks as we're giving you a narrative of how we construct portfolios. And the example today will be a large cap portfolio, a growth at reasonable price. And most of you would have that yourself. You construct it yourself. We'll talk about our mid cap X30 income strategy, which has been quite successful for three years. And we recently launched the LIC at a premium in August. And we'll talk about our micro cap, uh, which is uh, one of the longest running and largest in Australia with Bill. So we'll be doing a lot of talk about constructing portfolios, the narrative of constructing portfolios, a lot of stock ideas, and you can always, like I said, and reaffirm, be very selfish with your questions. It's about you, every one of you, and then continue that discussion uh, outside with one of the uh, portfolio managers or myself. Uh, there is a disclaimer, of course, that we all read, and uh, this is a wholesale disclaimer, and uh, so it's all about, uh, it's just general advice in the, in the, in the general world. But what I want to just very quickly just talk about Contango Asset Management for those that don't know. We're a wholesale fund manager first and foremost since 1998. It was formed uh, from HSBC Asset Management, where I was from and a few were from there, and the Packer family uh, back in those days. So Contango spends a lot of its time in that wholesale world uh, and uh, for industry super funds and the like. And it's also launched an LIC in the micro cap uh, to remind everyone in March of 2004 and we just did our second LIC earlier this year. So to give you an idea that we spent our day uh, with, with up to 22 staff just going through the various portfolios for industry super funds and our various wholesale clients. And uh, just to reaffirm, that's just the, the, the two LICs we have on the, on the uh, ASX. So the micro cap uh, with Bill Lace, it's got a long history there, and obviously the X30 dividend income. But uh, I'll spend the next uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, going through a few charts. And you don't have to look at the charts. You just have to listen to the narrative as well if, it, if there are too many lines on it. Uh, but the premise is that um, economics, economic conditions matter. They drive trade. They drive earnings. You are always buying future earnings when you're buying a stock to be part of your portfolio. What do you pay for those future earnings? What is reasonable? What are the assumptions in there? So economic conditions matter. A free trade agreement to South Korea, Japan and, and China is critical for corporate Australia and the recalibration of the earnings. And you've got to adjust your portfolio. Aging demographics are critical as well. So it does matter and it impacts valuation. But there's also shorter term cycles with more intense as well you need to be cognizant about. Is it reasonable to pay $52 for a dollar Domino's earnings? on the one year forward. Well, it's excessive given the market's at 15. Uh, but they're very good at doing something very simply. Uh, but quite clearly, that's an expensive one year forward price to pay. But three years forward, if you want to make the excuse, it's down to $34. So you get the idea, what do I buy? Why do I buy it? And how do I put it in the portfolio context? But economic conditions matter. What happens in Canberra matters. What happens in Washington matters. Stocks and sectors always perform differently through those cycles, and never ever forget that. Reform in the 80s in Australia assisted, assisted Australia. The GST reform in 2000 also assisted uh, the way you collect tax. There's, there's new, uh, new legislation needs to come through, obviously, and, and as leading indicators to help corporate Australia. Uh, but obviously the biggest impediment they have from the outset is a high corporate tax rate, and that's just not very conducive for them to compete in the region. Uh, and these relationships always can be explored, and that's what we try and do when constructing a portfolio. So chart number one that's quite confusing just shows three bar charts, but the point is it's global growth in total, it's, it's growth for the advanced economies and growth from the emerging economies. But the point to highlight is the GFC. That was very unforgiving. You don't want to have that too often. Uh, but the point was, growth is growing around the world, but it's growing less versus expectation, and it's still uneven. And that's the thing to highlight. So if you're revising global growth and regional growth lower, the impediment, the earnings upside from a macro perspective is not there. And you need to be cognizant of that. And that is why you've got the major companies in Australia, the top 10 companies, growing at less rates. That is why Woolworths, which we would have sold at $34, 
we identify as not growing its earnings for the foreseeable future as it's a structural impediment to that sector. The old duopoly is gone. You can't get 9% plus margins at supermarkets anymore. Audi's going to take over, etc. That says a lot, that chart, and I've, I've just, I've, a bit of a long bow, but it does matter. Earnings momentum versus expectation are critical. And global growth is slowing, regional growth is slowing, our largest trading partner, their growth is slowing, it's engineered in China, and in Australia we're lowering our growth profile. So you've got to look elsewhere for the upside to the earnings when constructing that portfolio. But it's not a hard landing in China in our mind, there's no hard landing because there's stimulus underway. Europe will still print money, Bank of Japan into their third decade of printing money, and the Chinese are innovative and also stimulating where they can. And I'm going to take it straight into Australia. So we've got a little bar chart there, and we're having a look at business confidence. So there's OK momentum in business confidence outside the mining sector. So the mining boom we've had, our grandchildren will read about it in textbooks. It's behind us. It was amazing. It was an amazing amount of money that hit this economy in an eight to 10 year period as a proportion of GDP that never would be done again. Up to 25% of uh, CapEx programs to GDP hit this economy at one period in 18 months. It's astonishing. And the economy is open, small, ex a small open economy, net energy food exporter and commodity exporter. And it couldn't really handle that and that boom we had. And it's going to take us another four, five, six, seven years to come off that. But outside of corporate Australia, they're doing OK. They need assistance. But it's a very uneven landscape on the earnings profile. And you've got to be very selfish to find who's going to drive those earnings. Because remember, we've, we're paying up for those future earnings. We want a reasonable return for that risk that we employ. And then we have consumer sentiment. And I think I might have a red dot here. Now, yesterday, we got a first one above 100. So this is a consumer sentiment chart since the 70s. I used to work at the Melbourne Institute collating this in the old days. So I quite like this. The RBA like it, so we watch it if they like it. It's a lot, it. It goes into a lot of other questions. Will you buy white goods? Will you get a loan, et cetera? But the point is you collate it. If the line's above 100, happy household. If the line's under 100, well, quite clearly that household's not very happy. Uh, if you've got double-digit inflation, 18% interest rates, and unemployment at uh, 12%, this is what happens. I'm just exaggerating the point. That was a very unforgiving recession in Australia. And not, not a good time to try and hold a mortgage as well, may I say. But the point to highlight is there's something going on in Australia. For all the wealth we've created, the last time we've had a recession is 91, 92. We're not very happy. Now, that did jump yesterday to above this line for the first time in a while. A bit of a Turnbull impact. It's effectively like a new honeymoon period, etc. cetera. So a bit of optimism building in there. Uh, but the household is feeling the income recession because they seem to be working longer for less and they're not happy, which is natural. But we want them more happy because we want them to go to JB Hi-Fi and we want them to go uh, to the geared version of JB Hi-Fi, Dick Smith. Uh, we want them to, to go out there. You want your daughter to go to La Vista and buy all that uh, cheap jewellery that they get in from Hong Kong. You want all of that. And this impacts that. But you want them to obviously consume out, out, you know, to restaurants, financial services, etc. This has a major driver. But the household is not as happy as corporate Australia in this recalibration. And it should be because of this. We've got interest rates, RBA cash rate. Historical lows, that's the point to highlight. We've deliberately removed 91 here when it's up here because it brings a tear to my eye. I have a personal bias, so I'll try to exercise that and understand it. But the point to highlight is historic low cash rates, the household should be much happier. We're here for a reason. It's that recalibration from the mining and it's impacting the way we construct our portfolios. And that's the futures curve. They are saying rates are heading lower, but the key here, even if they don't go lower, they're staying lower for longer. And the big four banks have raised interest rates on their customers anyway. It's effectively a tightening. Uh, and so their customers are effectively participating in making sure that their balance sheets are better. They've obviously raised capital because regulatory capital is required from the regulator at like offshore requirements. That's tier one. So they've raised the capital. We participated and then shared the pain in that. Uh, so, so all the banks have done is secure the quality of their dividend going forward. But it's a very tough environment for banks to grow credit the way they used to do. And it's all about the dividend for them going forward. So you're getting a 6 to 7% dividend, a bit of franking, but it won't be much capital gain. Those days are gone. That's the thing to highlight with the big four banks. And that is why that demerger cycle that we're big on has, has begun a couple of years ago. ANZ selling a sander makes a lot of sense. Uh, NAB selling the insurance business makes a lot of sense. And I have to put that capital aside. Uh, there's a template for selling fund managers called BT, created a lot of wealth in our small cap portfolio. 
So the template's there. The banks need to be clever at how they utilise their capital and demerge where they can. It's a different landscape for them going forward. But what they've done on raising the capital and in, uh, raising, and obviously with the shareholders participating in that pain and increasing the interest rates in their customer base, they've secured, for, for most people in this room who own the big four banks, they've secured the quality of that dividend stream. BHP is different. Payout ratio is 150%, borrowing money to pay the dividend, progressive dividend policies. Quite clearly the market doesn't want them to do that. They're not a traditional dividend payer sector or company, but nevertheless, uh, only BHP can borrow money and be okay with that and pay it out in the dividend. But you get the idea. Banks can do this. Other sectors, be wary. Energy sector, likewise, it's not the place to go and search for your dividends. Look at Santos. They finally got rid of their progressive dividend this week with a new management announcement. They're not natural dividend payers through a cycle. But you can get lucky for the short term. Understand what that's for, growth or income, because you can't have both, I'm afraid. And very quickly, I like this chart, if you've ever seen me speak anywhere, but this is a chart for 115 years, the percentage of people in our society, in Australia, over 50 years of age. I've circled something to exaggerate that slope of that curve. <clears throat> Slopes of curves for people like us, you know, it's increasing at an increasing rate. This is a issue for a lot of things. It means that uh, the 60-year-old is effectively a 40-year-old, the 80-year-old is effectively a 60-year-old, they're living longer, healthy, etc. Impact for Japara, Estia, that sector. Impact for leisure, it's good for mantra in your portfolio. Good for airlines, it's good for so many things. It, this, this is changing society in the Western world and the emerging world wants a bit of this. Uh, it, it also is a major dilemma for any government because you, you, you can't have Medicare with this. It, it's just the way it is, we've got to fund it somehow. Uh, and, and Europe's dealing with it and the US is dealing with it. And the reason why the, co the, the defined benefit was stopped by, uh, in, the late, in, the, in the 80s by the Hawke-Keating government is because they worked out, uh, obviously the inflation's an element to it, that they couldn't afford it. So you had to go co-contribution. So everyone in this room, like every other Australian, has to look after its own retirement. So that has a lot of implications for structural issues and for corporate earnings and how you construct portfolios. So a lot of new sectors popping up and very exciting uh, because of the demographic change. Now very quickly, we're going to have a look at some equity valuations because we love equities. So here we are just looking at one year forward multiples, really quite simple here for the A6. So the broad equity market here. So the long run historical is around 14 and a half, 15. So 15 bucks for a dollar of earnings for the ASX seems reasonable. Seems reasonable given its low rate environment and there's no risk that they're gonna be raising rates anytime soon. Seems reasonable that you've got steady, low, long bond yields. It seems reasonable versus those asset classes. And it seems reasonable even though the earnings are being downgraded from the big companies. So that's the point to highlight. So around there, and th this, this bit here is just about the earnings being revised lower. Remember 30 June? Year-on-year, year, market weight of adjusted, earnings for this country was negative 2.5%. Uh, it's meant to be 65 on average year in, year, in, year out. Uh, it's currently, for this fiscal year, 2.4. We think it'll be flat to negative. That's because of Woolies and Wes Farmers and Rio and BHP. So that's the point. They're growing, but those earnings, when you market weight adjust them, aren't contributing. You've got to find your earnings elsewhere, and that's what the three portfolios will go through will show where you where you, where you you Re recalibrate your attention to try and find the opportunity in the new sectors, technology and the like. So we think equity valuations are reasonable. Remember healthcare, you're paying 20, 22, 24, 25, 26 times or 25 bucks for a dollar of earnings because healthcare is a traditional defensive that is not imp impacted by its earnings through economic cycles. That's the whole point. That's why we like a, a CSL, a bit more cyclical ResMed and there's a few other Ramses of course. Uh, but this is probably the slide that, that we see major changes and also major changes as fund managers as well. So we've got the black line, the RBA cash rate once again, and staying lower and heading lower. You've got the dividend in orange and there's another line above it here, just the franking. That gap's never been like that before, just hasn't. You just haven't seen that gap. You've got to go back 40 years to see something like this when it's a completely different landscape. That demographic chart I showed you before says I need income in retirement. We have a retirement system that says that I can be as young, as young as 55 years of age, and on pension phase, it's Nirvana. Unfortunately, I'm always chasing it. When I, when I get to 55, it'll be changed to 60. When it gets to 60, 65, you get the idea. I'm born exactly the wrong time. I see what the people just ahead of me had, and that's what they've got. They've got Nirvana tax, tax treatment. Obviously, self-managed super fund is a tax structure. 
They've got the biggest gap for 40 years. They want income. They've got to pay those school fees for their grandkids. They've still got to get to Wimbledon. They've got to get to Whale Beach. <laughs> they've got to do all of that stuff, and they've got the money. And they can get that income, and it's treated well. Therefore, what happens is every time we speak to our clients, whether it's a wholesale or retail, they want more dividend income themes where they can. Can you give me more income, please? Can you give me? And that is why you must be careful, because that is what happened with the Woodside. People two years, two and a half years ago said, I'll buy some Woodside for some uh, income. It's not a traditional dividend income payer, the sector. The company's great, but it's going to unwind that biggest CapEx program it's seen in its history. So be wary of it. And again, the Santos example by cutting the progressive dividend. BHP is a beautiful, wonderful double-digit yield play, but the 150% payout ratio, it's, they're borrowing to pay, and not many companies in the world can, like Telstra and BHP can do it, but be wary that that's not what it's meant to do, and the whole world is telling BHP not to do that. Uh, so that is why we have big underweights to BHP. Uh, and sold most of our REA at $65. But you get the idea here. Be wary when searching for dividend. Don't just chase a yield. Blend the portfolio, and that's what we're going to try and do. So that chart, you can go on it for hours, but it really is driving so many outcomes because you, in this room, again, practice self-interest, you want, you've got the right vehicle, and you want the income. And charity funds are the same. So... We're going to go into a look at a portfolio, but the template is global growth modest. We're not alarmed. We're not alarmed with China. They've engineered the slowdown. They'll recalibrate it. They've done some good things. It's hurt earnings in Macau, of course, and it's, hurt, it's hurting whales and VIPs at Echo and Crown in Australia. Uh, but the point is, uh, generally, the China slowdown has been engineered. No hard landing. Underlying US growth has been progressive. It's good, uh, and it looks like they'll be doing measured rate rises very soon. That will have implications for Australia, lower Aussie dollar. Europe recovering, more QE coming. Uh, they're still halfway through that repair program. Another 10 years to go there, I'm afraid. And my beloved Greece. Uh, and the domestic economy is impacted. Always remember Australia, small open economy, net energy, commodity, food exporter. Free trade agreements matter for this economy and for the earnings. And, we, and and a lot of people are lining up to look at Australia. They're going to be buying more of the Vaders. So that goes out of our portfolio. did very well. They'll buy uh, Oceanos and the Tolls. They'll disappear. We lost a good brewer. Oh, it was a bad brewer from an earnings perspective, but good for drinking. So, and the SAB Miller now is going to be taken over as well. So we, we are losing corporate Australia a lot of its opportunity. That's why those demergers create new opportunities. But also from the, when Billy goes through the microcap fund, there's a lot of new, exciting companies coming through as well. So this section, we're just going to look at a large cap equity fund, which most of you will hold. That ref and we've got one uh, that we've been running since 1998. And then we'll go to Sean Burns for the X30 dividend income. Uh, and then we'll go to Billy and lots of Q&A as well. And in this section, we're going to talk even more stocks than I've brought up at the moment. So uh, hopefully you can keep up and enjoy it, I hope. Um, we'll go past. That's the narrative. We're looking for lower Aussie dollar, lower interest rates for longer. And, and remember, um, in this correction that we've seen in the equity market, we've traditionally run in the large cap space to the consumer staple to park ourselves. So in previous cycles, and it's a problem, you go and buy a duopoly like Coles and Woolies. But this time we haven't done that. We're very underweight and we've sold the Woolies because there's a structural change of those margins, global competition, etc. So we've had to go to other areas to park for defensive like REITs and utilities or healthcare. And that's what a lot of fund managers are finally doing at the moment. So the traditional duopoly is dead. If what's bad for Coles and Woolies is absolutely catastrophic for Metcash, and that is why Metcash never made into our mid-cap dividend income portfolio where two, three years ago it made all the right filters to go in. But this structural adjustment for our supermarkets it just shows you how corporate Australia needs to change. But at the same time, that's why we haven't participated. And to give you an idea, and hopefully this chart makes a bit of sense, we're trying to calibrate the way we look at the world. So when we look at the world from all those variables and all those charts that we had before, we measure them to the sensitivity of the earnings of 500 companies in Australia. And then we, we try and look at that market leverage and the defensive. So the market leverage are like diversify financials. We love Macquarie Bank. We've liked it a lot. It's got a good funds management business. It does very well in the Aussie dollar falls, etc. It, it's a good business. Nicholas Moore is, is very shrewd. He's lowered his cost base at the same time. So that's a diversified financial, it's got market leverage. We like Challenger, 
give an idea. Annuities, annuity businesses, all the white papers they do, they're pretty close with the government, etc. So they're good. They're good. With, and, and in a smaller sense, we like BT Investment Management. When it got spun off from Westpac, it was incentivised and it grew its earnings very well and we've done well out of it. So that's a market leverage. Defensive the utilities and, and, and the like, which are obvious like that, and some REITs. Uh, gold, uh, very difficult. We won't talk about it just yet. That can take a couple of days. Uh, and uh, interest rate sensitive and global cyclicals are Rio, BHPs, etc. So very underweight that sector because we we keep saying that there's no upside the bulk commodities. So at the beginning of the year we had a fifty dollar oil price and forty dollar iron ore price. It sort of came true. That's not good for earnings, but they'll keep the supply. So BHP, Rio, and Fortescue will continue to lower costs. They'll continue to move the supply curve of bulk commodities to the right. The supply goes up. Uh, but obviously the price is not going up, and that's the thing to understand about that sector. Uh, so that's how we look at it, and hopefully that made a bit of sense, because when we look at a large cap fund, just have a look at the, um, the top 10 holdings here at the moment of our large cap fund. So we recently were negative on banks the first half after the capital ratings. We're positive on banks, but not very positive. So we like banks. We own, we're underweight energy, and in that large cap we own one energy stock all year. That's oil search. That's, that's worked in our favour. We like our search for its quality assets in the PNG and a good emerging market to have those assets in the PNG. They like them so much that Woodside would want to buy them and we think they need to pay a higher price for that. Uh, obviously we like regionals and uh, this is a relatively new position. So we, what, what the capital requirements and the adjustment from the big four banks is levelling the playing field. It's good for regional banks finally after 20 years. They're not going to be taken out anymore uh, and they can make some good margins and good returns in a relative sense versus their, their four big competitors. Obviously you've got some defensive like uh, healthcare, global builders like James Hardy, obviously very cyclical to the US market, Brambles as well, Challenger. So you get a bit of an idea there. And some of the underweights here you can, you can probably see, you're not too surprised there. And this is how we look at that sector. So we, we, we break down the sectors again and again and again. But the highlight is diversified financials, healthcare feature out here, and metals and mining here. While we're, we're negative metals, we're negative mining, we're negative energy, uh, but Bill will go through why he likes lithium and graphite. So that's a, that's a standout to, to put that, for, tease you for later on. And, uh, and that's a consumer staple. So it's quite rare to be defensive and have that underweight to Wes Farmers and Woolies, but it's working at the moment. So hopefully that creates a nice little narrative. And my last chart, and sorry to give you so many charts and, and numbers, but this is a critical part of it is the EPS growth, what we're targeting, we are buying future earnings. We want to make sure we're not, we don't pay too much for those future earnings, but when we pay for those, they deliver those future earnings and hopefully a little bit more. So the portfolio is targeting just over 8% of the EPS growth year on year versus the market of 2.4, and we believe that will be negative, will be definitely flat to negative by 30 June next year. They'll be downgraded and downgraded because it's market cap adjusted, but our portfolio will be targeting as much growth as possible on balance, and a lot of that is healthcare. So hopefully that helps the messaging because the same thing will be for the next two portfolios. We're always trying to target an earnings momentum that is bigger than the universe that we're managing the money in, but in a defensive manner. And I won't go into too much detail, but the defensive manner is we've got a beta of around about in line with the market or lower. So the sensitivity of the earnings, the whole portfolio, is in line with the broader market. So the market's up 10%. This generally should be up 10.03%. Theoretically, if the market's down 10%, this is theoretically down 10.03%. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense there. Hopefully I've covered the top-down narrative, went through a large cap fund, and then the next section, Sean Burns, the senior portfolio manager, will go through a dividend income X30 fund and some of the stock ideas as well. So thank you and look forward to the Q&A.